Hello and welcome to the next lecture uh, in the course on introduction to computer and network performance analysis using queuing systems. I am Professor Varsha Apte and I am faculty member in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay. So, uh, in the previous lecture we discussed the theory of Little's law and we uh, did some intuitive understanding of Little's law. Uh, today we are going to do some examples and I will also actually start a case study where I will show you results of some experiments that are done with a real server and how we can apply queuing theory um, of, of open queuing systems which is what we have been learning so far in understanding those measurement results. Okay. So, let us continue. So, this is again recap uh, our standard table here just given for your reference. Uh, as usual we have some asympt asymptotic values for many of these uh, metrics. Uh, for the non asymptotes we actually uh, do not have a lot of the metrics for especially finite buffer right. When there is finite buffer we may not have a lot of metrics. Um, we just know their upper bounds and so on and especially for the uh, waiting time and number of uh, customers in the system those sort of metrics what we have is, is a relationship okay? and that relationship is what is Little's law which is what we had learnt in the previous lecture. So, again to remind everybody what Little's law says is n is equal to lambda r where n is the number of customers um, in a region, uh, lambda is the throughput, r is the response time. And uh, in uh, if you are talking about just the buffer, then this relationship will be the number of uh, customers in the buffer uh, is equal to throughput multiplied by the waiting time which is the time in the buffer. Okay. So, let us move ahead and uh, look at some examples. So, this is actually recalling uh, an example from our uh, lecture 7 where we had done lot of just practice examples for utilization law for asymptotes and so on. Uh, you can go back and revise that lecture and that is the example 5 I have taken just for continuity. Uh, the example is of a single threaded server uh, running on one core CPU, uh, buffer size is uh, 10 and 1 in the server. So, total number of requests that can sit uh, at the server is 11. Uh, request processing time is 5 milliseconds, request inter arrival time is 6 milliseconds. So, this is a stable system, right? It is a stable system, uh, and we, we had discussed uh, various asymptotes. Uh, the only reason I am showing this here right now is to actually uh, bring home the point that uh, all these asymptotes we had actually written before we studied Little's law. These are nothing to do with Little's law, but you will find uh, it uh, nice uh, that actually if you apply Little's law to these numbers they will match. Um, for the lambda uh, uh, going to 0 it is sort of trivially applicable you should check that yourself, but let us check it for the high load asymptote. Okay. So, let us first check n is equal to lambda r. So, n here is 11, n here is 11. So, we have 11 here and on this side we have throughput is 200 request per second and response time is 55 milliseconds. So, we divide that, that by 1000 and this you can trivially check that is actually equal right. So, 200 multiplied by 55 this is going to be 11,000 divided by 1000 and you get 11. Same thing for the uh, q is equal to lambda w. Right on this side we have 10 um, and then on the other side we have again 200 this time multiplied by 50 since it is milliseconds we will divide it by 1000. Okay. Of course, it is going to be this is 10,000 divided by 1000 which is equal to 10. Okay. So, uh, it is again it is interesting because we had not used Little's law in actually deriving these things, but you can see that uh, these uh, asymptotes actually do follow from Little's law also. Okay, so, let us move on. Um, how about the same example? Um, we had actually tried to write something uh, at a point that is neither at a low load or at a high load at some kind of a medium load. Okay. So, uh, this is what we had written that uh, given what the uh, numbers are if this is the if this is lambda basically this is around 167. Uh, all we can say is that throughput is going to be something less than 167 requests uh, give because it is a finite buffer. Okay. So, uh, we do not know we have not done uh, the background yet to calculate uh, the probability of loss. Uh, let us just suppose that this throughput is given suppose it is measured. Right. Suppose we are observing this server 
and we have measured the throughput and we know that the throughput is 150 requests per second. Okay? So, given this um, actually we can write CPU utilization, right? we can we know that uh, CPU utilization should be equal to throughput multiplied by tau, we just have one core, so there is no divided by C. So, this is 150 multiplied by uh, tau is 5 uh, divided by 1000 because 5 is milliseconds and so this is 0 0.75, right? this is 0 0.75. Okay, so, we can uh, from here we get the utilization. Uh, now, again Q length between Q length and waiting time or number in system or response time we need one. We, we do not know yet how to calculate both. We know the relationship between N and R and uh, lambda, but we, we, we need uh, two out of those three to calculate the third one. Right? So, throughput is given, suppose Q length is also given, this is Q, this is also given. So, now we can write if we have been given Q, we can write W, right. So, we know that uh, Q is equal to uh, lambda W. So, W should be equal to Q by lambda and so this should be equal to 8 divided by 150. This will be in seconds and so this will be equal to 8000 uh, by 150 milliseconds and this is 800 by 15 milliseconds. Okay? So, whatever that is. Um, similarly, uh, if Q length is given and we also know of course the utilization, we can actually write the number in system as follows. Okay? So, uh, N which is an average, okay? remember that these are average. So, this average is going to be equal to the average in the Q which is the Q plus the average in, in the server. Okay? So, note that this average is not 1, okay? average in the server is not 1, the average in the server uh, given that it is one server, it is basically the utilization. Okay? So, why is it that? Because uh, with probability rho there is 1 in the server and with probability 1 minus rho there is 0 in the server right rho is utilization rho is probability that the server is busy so this is going to be nothing but rho so another interpretation of of utilization uh, for a single core for a single server q uh, is the average number of customers in the server getting service okay average in server getting service Okay. So, this is nothing but Q plus rho. So, this is actually 8.75 and now that we have n we can get r right again we have n is equal to lambda r. So, r is equal to n by lambda. So, this is going to be equal to 8.75 divided by 150 in seconds and that is uh, 8750 by 150 milliseconds and that is 875 by 15 milliseconds. Okay. So, this is what we can do with Little's law um, and um, we are not calculating loss probability that is not something Little's law helps us with. So, this is just repeating the calculations I showed and I am just doing the calculations here now. So, 8 by 150 is 53.3 milliseconds and uh, 8.7 by 5 by 150 is 58.3 milliseconds. This of course, response time is actually always equal to waiting time plus service time. Okay? So, that you can see that we did not actually calculate it that way, but we ended up with the correct relationship. This is 53.3, this is 58.3 and that is actually waiting time plus service time. Okay? So, this is the one example of how we can apply Little's law to adjust a straightforward queuing system. Now, let us go to some one interesting example. Okay? I want to make give you some applications and not just uh, artificial cues uh, to do to think about Little's law. Okay? So, I am going to read out this example. Consider a database server and a web server. I okay, will draw this as I read it. So, suppose there is a database server. I am going to show a server like this, like a server kind of a machine. This is the database server. Okay? And there is a web server. Okay, so this is a different machine, a web server. 
they do not have to be different machines, but let us assume that they are different machines okay. that calls the database server. So, there are threads, the web server threads here, there are database server threads here, there is of course a disk and there is CPU, here also there is a disk and there is CPU. So, we are not really operating at that level of detail, all we know is that there is a database server and a web server that calls the database server. Okay. So, there are this, there is call and there is a response. Okay. Uh, suppose for a certain long duration t to t plus t, so t is large, okay. t is large, you have access to the database server's timestamp log. Okay. So, in this uh, disk, let us assume that the database server writes some kind of a log okay, with some timestamps t1, t2, t3 it writes. Okay. Of what is it the log of? It is a log of completed requests. Uh, completed queries. Okay. Web server makes a query to the database, database sends a response and whenever it sends a response, it writes the timestamp that this is that I have sent this uh, response back. Okay. And suppose you have this from T to T plus capital T. Okay. And in that same time, uh, the web server also records the response time of all the queries. Okay. So, let us assume that uh, this time, this time elapsed okay the response time this is also recorded by the database server in some kind of a log so we have some r1 r2 r3 from t2 t plus capital t okay so these two things we have okay uh, can you estimate how many queries are either queued or being processed at the db server Okay. So, in this duration t to t plus t which is given to be long, uh, we assume it to be long so that we can assume steady state okay. and we will have to assume stability and we will have to assume various uh, the scheduling policy at the db server uh, uh, is consistent with little fly assumptions. Okay. But for the moment let us not complicate things and let us think of this as a real problem where we have this kind of a multi-tier web server and database server setup, and we are trying to figure out uh, maybe we need to figure out the memory requirement of the queries that are waiting in the database server. right? We need to have enough of a buffer size there. So, we need to know how many queries are ending up at the database server. Maybe there is some bottleneck and that is why we need to figure out how many queries are waiting or being served at the database server. So, as a first cut uh, can we try and estimate what is going to be the uh, number of queries here. Okay? So, if I show the queries uh, at the database server uh, by let us say these are the, the queries from the web server okay, that are queued here or they are executing. Okay. Uh, then how many are there? Okay. So, uh, what we are doing going the essential question here is that if you think of the database server as the little slaw region. then we are asking basically for the n average n inside this region. Okay. So, it is not very difficult we already know the time through this region right the time that the, the uh, query enters here and, and exits here. Uh, if we assume that uh, network delay is negligible then the web server is actually recording this time right so we have we can average this we can find an average r um, now what do we have here if if the uh, database server is writing a time stamped uh, uh, entry of all the completed requests that means we can count the number C of requests 
completed in time t in t plus capital T right. And if this is C then we know that throughput is nothing but C by T. Okay. So, we can find the average from the response time log we can find the average response time from the response time log, we can find the throughput from the uh, from the database server completed queries log. So, that is it we have lambda we have we have lambda we have r. So, n will be lambda r. Okay. So, yes we can uh, we can estimate uh, we have to make some assumptions that uh, there is uh, you know requests are not disappearing somewhere that requests do not spawn all those little slow assumption of course implicitly we are assuming uh, there is also no uh, you know the since we are recording the elapsed time the response time at the web server we are assuming that that time is dominated by the time at the database server and the network delay and all other delays are negligible. But uh, I wanted to give this example to show that in real life when you are trying to apply queuing systems you do have to make some reasonable assumptions. This is okay if this was on the LAN these are all on the LAN on the local area network the web server and the database server if they are on the local area network this is a reasonable assumption and this is a reasonable way to estimate how many queries are at the database server. If this the, uh, these two servers are not on the same LAN they are separated by a, a big network then actually our model and our approach is, is not correct. We will have to uh, uh, use some advanced reasoning. Okay. Okay. Let us go to the this again just summarizes what I already said you can revise this uh, offline. Yeah. So, let us go to the next problem. Um, this is an interesting setup again I am giving a slightly different uh, scenario for little slaw so that you see something how little slaw gets applied in very different scenarios. Okay. All right. Assume that emails come to my inbox at the rate of 10 per hour. Okay. So, now I am going to just draw something let us say like a laptop. Okay, and uh, this is me and I am reading my email. Okay. Assume that emails come to my inbox at the rate of 10 per hour. Okay. So, uh, let us assume that my inbox is on my laptop and emails come here at the rate of 10 per hour. An email sits in my mailbox on an average uh, for 1 hour before I read and immediately delete uh, delete it. Okay. So, emails are basically uh, sort of queuing in a in a disk on a disk there okay. and uh, what it says is that uh, the time from which an email comes to my laptop and the time by which I read it and I delete it this is 1 hour. Okay. Um, so, now, uh, suppose that the average size of email is each email is uh, one email is 200 kilobytes. Okay. Assume that my disk space is large enough that there is always space to store an arriving email uh, that means the mailbox never gets full there is an infinite buffer here in the disk in the laptop. Okay. Um, and uh, so, the so I, I do not have a, a problem of a mail getting dropped or anything. Okay. So, basically we are assuming infinite buffer. Okay. On an average how much disk space am I using to store my emails? Assume that I do nothing other than reading and deleting email all the time and that I can do so at the rate of more than 10 per hour. Okay. This is being given to show stability. Okay. This is my mu. So, all that, that it says is that mu is greater than 10. So, this is a stable system we never want to apply little slaw when the system is not stable. Okay. Now, you might say what is little's law here, what is the queue, what is the server. Okay. So, here I am the server okay. and the service I am giving of uh, read and then delete. Okay. 
Okay. So, uh, my little slow region is basically like me and this laptop okay. and uh, the deleting of the email is like the exit. Okay. Uh, emails come in and exit is basically like a delete, is the delete is basically like the exit. And what I have been given is that this journey takes 1 hour. Okay, so, this is 1 hour through this and I have been since it is stable I know that the throughput is 10 per hour. Okay. So, r is 1 lambda is 10 per hour and what is being asked is uh, how much disk space am I using. Okay. Obviously, what I need to find out here is the average number of emails. Okay. What I need to find? Need to find the average number of emails uh, queued or currently being read in my mailbox. Right? If I find this then I can multiply that by 200 kilobytes and I will get the space taken. Right? So, obviously I got r, I got lambda. So, I have n equal to lambda r which is uh, 10 and uh, that is I multiply this by 1 and I get uh, 10 and I have uh, now I have to just calculate how much space this takes right. So, 10 multiplied by 200 kb will be 2000 kb which is around 2 megabytes. Okay. So, again I can use little slot to find the uh, to answer this question. So, I think in both these examples I hope that you realized how uh, you have to kind of innovatively apply little slow you have to figure out what the region is that we are talking about a journey of, uh, of a request uh, through a system what is the server where is the response time and uh, uh, often little slow really works out and it is very useful uh, in, in situations that you might ima not imagine that little slow applies. So, this one uh, again just that was showing the solution. Okay. So, uh, last thing that I wanted to do today was to actually start one case study. Okay. The case study is of um, experimental performance measurement of a web server. See so far in this course uh, we have learnt a lot of theory, but uh, the theory uh, is not for the sake of theory, this theory has a very practical application in it and the practical application is to understand the performance of uh, typically of uh, web servers and multi-tier network servers or networks or um, other resources in computing systems like uh, even log file we had discussed in our very first lecture that it can also be a resource. So, this is our world and we, we want to be able to uh, understand our world of computing through the queuing, through queuing systems. So, we had a lot of theory, lot of toy examples, but if we really measure a web server, if we really do measure all these metrics on, a, on some server, will they be close to what we learned, will, will they match what we theoretically would have predicted. So, that is what this case study is about. Okay. So, what is the setup? Okay. There is an experimental setup here. We have a server machine on which a web server runs. Okay. So, web servers, uh, modern web servers are either they, they spawn multiple processes or some of them are multi-threaded um, and so we, we have a web server running and the web server runs a CPU bound script. So, for the sake of a simple experiment, uh, we have kept the script um, a little simple and just CPU bound it's just a tight loop, tight CPU loop and it does nothing other than just using the CPU for a given amount of time. 
Now if we want to study the behavior of this web server under some kind of load, then uh, we, we need to have load coming to it. Since it is an experiment, we need to generate that load artificially and what you have here is when you can get software which generates artificial web server requests. Uh, there are basically threads here that behave like users and these threads basically send requests to the web server. Okay? So, the web requests are sent and the web server sends responses and uh, the, this load generator uh, notes response time. So, for the sake of uh, analysis and throughput is also measured at the, uh, at the uh, load generator and at the server we can have we can use uh, operating system utilities to uh, measure things like utilization, okay? CPU utilization. So, we have requests uh, that we can specify a given arrival rate and they are sent from the client to the web server. For each request the web server executes a CPU bound script uh, and sends a small response. We do not want to load the network in this experiment, so we just send a small res response. Uh, in this first experiment the execution time of the script is known, it is approximately 50 milliseconds. There is one core in the server and one thread, so it is basically just a single threaded system. Okay? So, it is G, G1 and actually there is a limited buffer, but we do not know what it that is. Okay? Uh, because anything in real life in, a, in the server there, the, there will be a maximum number of processes or maximum number of requests that can queue uh, at, the, at the web server. So, uh, there is no such thing as uh, really as an infinite buffer. So, here there is a finite buffer. Uh, so, that is what the system is. The, the execution time of the script is fairly deterministic. So, we could think of this as GD1K. Okay. Okay. So, uh, other uh, and of course, this is also done on the LAN, so all the other delays we are ignoring. So, uh, let us see what the throughput of this system uh, is going to be. Now, given that we know the, the service time of the system and we know uh, that it has one core, we can actually draw this throughput graph, right. So, suppose we draw it. Uh, as uh, versus arrival rate of course. So, this is throughput versus arrival rate. Uh, we know that 50 milliseconds is a service time. So, mu is going to be 20 requests per second. So, this is very easy to draw. This is 20, this is 20 till this point this is going to be a just a straight line and theoretically we know that this is going to flatten out at 20 requests per second. This is our theoretical prediction. Let us see what happens in the measured graph. Okay. So, this is actually measured, right. So, this is again throughput uh, request per second on the y axis, arrival rate request per second on the x axis. You can see that pretty much at 5, it is 5, um, at 10, it is 10, at 15 it is 15. So, uh, it is fairly uh, theoretic the way we predict it theoretically is exactly what was measured at 20 it is also just about 20. Okay? This, this uh, orange line is measured and the blue line is the predicted the calculated is shown here. After 20 there is some divergence. Okay? Uh, you will rarely see this flattening out in real systems. We will discuss the reasons why later today I am just showing this to you. Similarly, uh, we can do utilization, right? Utilization is also very easy to predict. Let us draw the graph first, our own graph first. Okay. Uh, we know this should be, so this is versus uh, arrival rate, row, this is uh, 0 to 1, let us say. So, we know that at 20 requests per second, we should have 100 percent utilization and till then it should be linear and this slope is actually going to be tau and this is this is what it is right so let's see what the actual measurement was okay yes as you can see at 20 uh, this is the the uh, orange line again shows the the measured uh, results and at 20 it is exactly 100% 
and at 0 there is no point here, there, they, there is no, uh, I mean obviously it is going to be 0, there was no separate measurement, but all other points also you can see, you can extend this line and you can see that it is going to be just a really, really almost like a theoretically correct straight line, but all these, these orange points are measured. Okay, a slight difference here, but otherwise quite uh, matching the theoretical prediction, right. So, this is just a first glimpse of some results. Uh, this is response time, all these values, these are not visible here at this scale, uh, but all the values at the low load are actually 51 milliseconds. So, remember this is the low load asymptote is supposed to be tau, the service time which was 50 milliseconds. So, this also matches quite well. And then there is some increase that happens here, okay. And this is something that we do not know yet, okay. So, what about comparing the predicted response time uh, with the at the higher arrival rates? Uh, so far, whatever we have learnt in theory, we have only learnt again, we have learnt you know n is equal to lambda r, we have learnt the relationships, but we have not stand alone learnt how to calculate either r or n. Okay, so, we still we do not know this, we do not know this. Okay. So, that is what we will be doing in the next class. Uh, we will be doing uh, some results for uh, mg1 q's where we actually can calculate the response time and there is also some properties of memoryless arrivals that we will be going over. And then we will come back to this case study and see whether we can compare the theoretical response time with the uh, measured response time. Thank you.